We have three speakers who are going to come up and, and help us think through um, the state of augmented uh, reality and, and virtual reality and um, what directions we might see that go um, in the next 10 years or so. Um, some of these folks are really uh, doing innovative things in this space locally and so we're pretty excited to have these folks. So uh, I'd like to introduce Al Dr. Alan Rudolph, uh, the Vice President of Research here at CSU. He's uh, been really driving our VR efforts here on campus and so we're excited to hear what he has to say. Thank you. So these are the Ignite sessions. I guess we're supposed to ignite in 10 minutes. I'll start the ignition and then uh, we'll be followed by my fellow speakers. I often get asked by my kids, how did I get involved with VR? And I think the most obvious answer is reality is really tough right now. Uh, <laughs> and if you uh, turn on the uh, news at 6 o'clock, it's not hard to reach for a goggle or a set of AR glasses and uh, check into what the future is really bringing us. And, you know, the talks we heard earlier were a great precy for what I think the three of us are going to talk about. I think I'm going to be more on the application side because our colleagues from HP and NVIDIA are driving both the hardware and the software, the algorithms. Um, and naturally, uh, as a Vice President of Research at Colorado State, it's great to talk from the platform of a land-grant mission. Um, just a little bit of my history with VR, it starts actually 20 years ago. VR and AR are not a new technology. In fact, there's a lot of research out there on virtual and augmented immersive uh, environments, and they've been used for quite some time, uh, mostly by the Defense Department, and in fact in some industry settings where mostly around training, as uh, you might expect uh, the Defense Department to use it, but even in conditions uh, for things like post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, in cognitive behavioral therapies, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I think Lee said nicely earlier today that uh, the real two areas in the Pew report that came forward for VR and AR in the application space, and I'll probably spend more time on those, are in healthcare and education, both of which are, of course, uh, very much central to our mission here at Colorado State University, whether it's uh, dealing with the wellness and, and the quality of life we have, which is great here in Fort Collins and in the Front Range, and also the future platform of which we're training the next workforce to be involved with AR and VR. Actually, it's fun when you sit in the audience, you get old enough and you see slides uh, that you started work on 20, year, 20 years ago. And in fact, uh, for me, the path started at the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency known as DARPA, which is an agency established by Eisenhower in 58 around Sputnik. And their mission is to avoid technological surprise. That mission exists today. And when I arrived as the first and I think the only zoologist to work at DARPA, and my boss used to sometimes get it wrong and, could, and say we even have a zookeeper, uh, I, I would uh, get to work on really the areas of understanding brain-machine interfaces and launch one of the first programs there. Fortunate enough to see it in uh, animals all the way to human clinical trials, which I participate still in. And, and so I think just to reflect uh, what we're doing here at Colorado State, as it was said, I, uh, when I came four and a half years ago as a first time academician, uh, having spent time in both industry and government, it was a great palette from which to now, with the next generation of hardware and software, to really launch into what might be uh, the next five to 10 years of the future vision of AR and VR. And so let me uh, spend the rest of the time on that and just giving you a snapshot of uh, really what is possible. So let me start with the healthcare field because uh, we all know a very well-known effect in the medical profession where it, and certainly uh, we track, have been tracking it, it's called placebo. Placebo effects are really those that are driven by the perceptive power or belief state people have about medicine. And if you track the clinical trial history over the last 20 years of placebo effect is rising. And why is that important? Well, the pharmaceutical industry, if you want to develop a new drug and you want to demonstrate its efficacy or its usefulness, you have to do it over a standard uh, set of care, show that it's much better than what we have today. And if, if the placebo effect is starting to rise and you can't show that efficacy over a placebo effect, the FDA says, well, you know, you don't have something that you think you have. And so, uh, we've understood the perceptive power in medicine, and now we're actually using these environments to drive that. And the most powerful examples we have are ones that are driving uh, conditions like pain. There's a program you can go out and search now 
called Snow World, which was developed in uh, the Northwest at the University of Washington and commercialized. Very effective in taking kids with pediatric pain from burns or cancer and putting them into an Arctic world. And you can measure evidence-based outcomes of these kids showing reduced symptoms of pain associated with burns. Um, the psychological and cognitive behavioral therapy areas around phobias and fears, uh, trauma, and, and, and are also being actively pursued. There are now some 75 VR healthcare companies out there now pursuing these things. So this is a very active area, and at CSU we're very active in this. We have a, uh, one of our uh, highlight programs is called B Sharp, where we've um, partnered with the Fort Collins Symphony, and we have taken people with dementia in our community with their caregivers and shown that over the course of two symphony seasons, these people have reduced cognitive decline compared to healthy age match controls of the same age. Um, or, I'm sorry, age match controls of the, of the same uh, population of dementia and decline. So clearly we've known things that uh, immerse people in healthy environments around arts and, and literature and music uh, are, are healthy um, vectors in, in their own uh, conditions. And now we're taking a project where we're actually going to extend this in an immersive virtual environment. We'll be filming the symphony on May 12th in creating an immersive experience. And it's really interesting to think over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna be do, doing more therapeutic storytelling. I've produced five VR or AR uh, productions and uh, one of these actually pursues this route of trying to uh, intercede with the psychological conditions of people using virtual and immersive environments. Now on the educational front, uh, there's a plethora of things we're engaged in here on campus. I'm, for those of you who visited us uh, and coming to the conference, you've seen a lot of building around us, and the building continues. One of the buildings uh, that we're putting up and broke ground on about six months ago, it'll be done in the fall, is a design center. And inside the design center, we'll be putting a 50-person VR uh, theater. And I think you're going to see VR theaters popping up across the nation where there'll be content, much what we heard, uh, here today with regard to entertainment or other types of uh, other types of applications. But we'll be using it to really uh, understand how the virtual environment affects learning. Now, those of us who've been around uh, saw the introduction of the internet in the classroom, uh, jumped up and down and declared that education was going to be transformed. And we only found out that we really had to understand learning outcomes on an evidence-based and a very rigorous basis to make that claim even about the internet. And now we have a lot of online education. So the 25 or 30 years in which that's taken place has delivered us a higher state of educational delivery. I think VR and AR is positioned well to do that. And we're uh, engaged in that kind of activity both around our curriculum. And so Colorado State has one of the largest and oldest online uh, campuses. It's called CSU Global. And we've started a project to uh, actually begin delivery of curriculum through CSU Global. There's quite a, a bit of educational content being driven in VR and AR now. And so I think you're going to see the ability for us, and we envision in the next five years, to basically ship either rent people a goggle or an, an AR set of glasses, uh, and then deliver them coursework, uh, download their course and immersive experience. We're starting out with a liberal arts curriculum as well as a more technical curriculum. And in this earliest phase, what our intent is to really understand uh, what is the, uh, uh, the value of learning inside that environment? And for any of you who've been inside of a virtual and augmented environment, it is amazing. It will transform you to places that you don't uh, see. Uh, it will give you experiences you ha won't have and emotions uh, that you uh, will experience for the first time. It is a very powerful, perceptive environment. The last thing I'd leave you with uh, in my 10 minutes of ignition is that uh, the collaborative ethos on Colorado State campus is very high. I think this is a function of our geography being in the front range, uh, but it's also, I think, the f function of th 300 days of sunshine. We really enjoy, I think, uh, a, a very good quality of life, and that leads people to want to collaborate. Uh, we have a very high collaborative value here at campus. What's interesting about VR, and we're starting to create some spaces to look carefully at that collaborative environment, because putting on a goggle now or, or putting an AR uh, HoloLens on, I can have my collaborator who may be 
in Europe, who may be in Asia, who may be in Latin America. I can have them in the room with me. Maybe I could even have them doing experiments with me. I could maybe have even doing experiments across campus, on West Campus, in East Campus. So we're closing the space and time for collaborative energy. And for a campus like Colorado State, which is naturally collaborative, this is a really powerful space we want to explore. And so in addition to those VR theaters, we're going to be creating some very intentional collaborative spaces to explore how can we bring people closer together and really uh, enhance our already collaborative power here at Colorado State. So uh, that's uh, my 10 minutes uh, in ignition, and I'll turn it over to one of my colleagues, and we'll come back and answer some of your questions. Thank you. Uh, now we have, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he's the distinguished technologist, so I was, I was thinking about how to bring that up, and uh, that's what yeah. I wanted to say. It's like, how do you get that title? It's such a cool title. So, distinguished technologist from HP, uh, Paul Martin, thank you for coming today. You bet. How, how you get the title is uh, you stay there too long and uh, you're old. And I see another distinguished technologist in the audience as well, who's at the other side of HP. But, okay, let's see if I can, it also means you can't see. So, uh, press the top button, I assume, or side button, there we go. Whoa. We went too far. Okay, so uh, I'm Paul Martin, work at HP down the road here. Um, I am a DT and I work on uh, AR and VR at HP. Lucky enough to do that. I've been uh, doing that since I was a child. Um, you can ask my parents. Uh, and speaking of history, I was going to go through a little history because uh, I'm supposed to talk about the future of AR and VR. And uh, many times looking backwards is a good way to figure out what's going to happen in the future. So uh, let's, uh, there's a visual pun there, by the way. Um, let's look backwards. So the whole concept of artificial reality is, is certainly not new. Um, back in the mid-1800s, people were doing stereograms or de uh, daguerreotypes and uh, taking pictures with two cameras, if effectively, and generating stereo pairs that way. Even farther back, people, uh, Will and I were just talking, were drawing, doing cave drawings in caves in France and, you know, an early uh, alternate representation of reality. So um, it's not a new concept. Um, it's uh, uh, not new again. Uh, so this is in 62. This is a guy named Morton Heilig, who was a filmmaker. And he was unhappy with the immersive quality of films at the time and decided to do something about it. So he created this uh, amazing device, which, by the way, you can buy online for a few hundred thousand. Uh, it's called the Sensorama. And uh, this amazing device, whoops, got to bounce there, um, gave you stereo images, uh, stereo sound. Uh, vibrations and hopefully uncorrelated aromas and wind. Um, and um, so you could, uh, you could sit in this thing and have a, a really immersive experience. Um, so the, the real amazing thing about this was he actually wrote a patent on the concept of a head-mounted display that gave you stereo and uh, gave you, um, uh, you know, imagery in space basically in front of you. And if you look at the, this patent written in 1960, it looks almost exactly like um, an Oculus Rift or, or an HTC Vive. So this is 1960. Technology different? Uh, yeah, you'd have CRTs instead of OLEDs or, um, or LCDs, but uh, basically the same concept. So um, a scant few years later, there's a guy named Ivan Sutherland, um, and that's him behind the, the headgear there. Uh, and he, uh, he actually wrote two seminal papers. And uh, the first was called The Ultimate Display. And uh, this was actually basically a description of the Star Trek um, holodeck. So in this paper, it's only a page and a half, two pages long, he describes uh, people being able to go into this room, um, the ultimate display he calls it, and experience alternate realities, including uh, touch, you know, sense of touch, um, taste, um, feeling things like wind and so forth. Uh, if you ate something that tasted good, you'd know it, et cetera. So very, very um, early thinking about uh, immersive and uh, he wrote a second paper, said, well, gee, that's a great idea, but I should do something about it. And uh, he wrote a second paper called The Head-Mounted 3D Display. And he got a bunch of grad students, which is common practice, I think, um, to uh, work on this. And uh, they actually created a head-mounted 3D display. And it looked like that. Um, and it was uh, fondly nicknamed the uh, Sword of Damocles because of the uh, menacing nature 
Um, the, uh, that's actually the tracking system there um, above his head, and he's using an uh, ultrasonic emitter on his head there, but he was able to wander around within 3D, a 3D environment, and it was all very, very primitive graphics, line graphics and so forth, but um, it was the first step. Okay, so um, he started the trend, and he had a bunch of grad students, people like um, Jim Clark, uh, uh, L.B. Ray Smith, uh, Ed Catmull, that became giants in the computer graphics industry after that and went on to create things like this. So now we have today, uh, uh, we have a huge variety of head-mounted displays that are less bulky and menacing. And um, they do various things, uh, virtual reality, they do mixed reality, and they do augmented reality. And uh, luckily we have uh, our friends at NVIDIA to uh, uh, create some amazing graphics cards that will drive these displays and uh, create amazing worlds that Alan described uh, in the various use cases he talked about. Um, so, that's kind of the state of the art today. Um, uh, so what does the future hold? So that's the history part. Okay, so let's extrapolate forward and, and what does it mean moving forward? Okay. So I think it means the same thing. Uh, I think it means that people are still trying to create the ultimate display. I think that's what, um, what he called the ultimate display. I would call it the holodeck perhaps, and so would NVIDIA by the way. Um, and I think that's still the goal for people is to change their reality for some reason. Not sure why, but um, so, um, <laughs> yeah. So there was a book written about it, and you guys have, maybe many of you have read this book. I won't ask for a raise of hands because it's embarrassing um, for me. But um, uh, Ready Player One, Ernest Klein, I think 2013, uh, and recently, of course, Steven Spielberg made a movie out of it. This is after he said uh, he would never do anything with virtual reality, by the way. He actually had some demos and uh, got religion, as it were, and uh, made this movie. And um, I don't know, has anybody seen this movie, RPO? Yeah? Yeah, maybe 20% something. I saw it the other day. It was, it's a classic Spielberg movie, pretty good movie, uh, lots of extrapolation. Um, but um, yeah, okay. So um, there are commercial visions about this future as well. So this is maybe an encapsulation of Microsoft's uh, future vision about uh, virtual and what they actually call mixed reality. So you're in an environment and you can mix the real world with the synthetic world. Uh, and you can do things like uh, run your favorite Microsoft apps, you know, on subscription now. Um, you can interact with avatars. Uh, you can interact with your friends, you can interact with AI uh, bots and so forth, and just generally have a good time. And if it's going to be so fun, you're going to want to spend a lot of your time in there, um, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, 10 bucks a day or something. So that's, that's one vision of the future. Um, this is, uh, I had to do a shameless plug here. There's our new VR backpack, by the way. Okay. Um, so I'll back out. There we go. Um, so HP, um, we're pretty commercially oriented and we're uh, very focused on product design and architecture and, and Will Wade, who's coming up after me, will talk a lot about those segments. Um, so this is kind of the way we see, uh, see things that um, VR and AR are tools to help people get their jobs done, the workflow kind of tools, and uh, automotive is a, is a prime example. And uh, speaking of uh, NVIDIA, um, this is at uh, GTC, which is NVIDIA's graphics conference, uh, I think not this year, but the previous year. And uh, there's a bunch of, um, uh, I'll just say it, geeks um, uh, with headsets on, and they're enjoying an experience called Holodeck. And, and this is what it looks like to us outside, but inside this great world, it looks like this. And these guys, uh, they got no legs, that's okay, um, but, they, um, but they're able to huddle around a, a McLaren uh, and, uh, and comment to each other how great it looks or what it, if it was a different color or if we slice through it or things like that. So this is, what, um, this is what's going to be happening in the very near future in terms of user interaction in VR, this kind of stuff, okay? Okay, so uh, what are the challenges in doing this? Well, they have to do, frankly, with the human sensory systems, right? So we have at least five senses. Some people say up to 20, um, but, you know, the obvious ones are these um, that you're seeing uh, roll out here. Um, and uh, they're all important to really recreate reality effectively for people. The, um, the area where people have been making uh, in the industry most progress currently has been in the area of the visual aspect, okay? All the other ones are important, but frankly, people have been focusing on, on visuals here. So I'm going to go into a little depth on that, show you a quick video, and then all my 10 minutes will be more than up probably. 
So, um, and this is apologies to uh, a guy named Michael Abrash, who's uh, uh, head of uh, VR at, at Oculus or CTO uh, there. So today, the state of the art is that the resolution of these devices is roughly what you see there, 1600 by 1400 per eye. The pixel density, so the little image elements you see in front of you, um, uh, roughly 10 to 15 per degree of your vision. So one degree, you see about 10 to 15 of those things. Field of view is about 100 degrees, so roughly like that. And the depth of focus is interesting because it's always fixed. When I have a headset on, I don't see, um, if there's an object way off in the distance, guess what, it's really this far away. If there's an object right in front of me, it's that far away. Your eyes will tow in to look at the object, but your eyes will not focus. And that's the, that's a source of consternation with uh, people, physi uh, physiologists, um, that the fact that your eyes are not changing focus really when you're looking at objects. And there's a well-known effect called the virgin's accommodation effect that um, kind of describes that. So if you compare what we can do today to what humans can do, um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, resolution totally is about 50 to 100 X better than we can display today. The uh, pixels per degree, which is ba basically kind of the square root of the one to the left, is uh, about uh, 60 to 80 ppd, so 5 to 8x. You can actually see things more than 180 degrees around you, so humans are really good at that. You know, if the lion is coming after you, you should uh, be able to detect it and run. Um, and then uh, we have variable focus as well, okay? So, um, so one of the active areas in VR right now, looking forward, is to address these issues, okay? And it turns out there's some good news. Uh, humans with their physiology provided a, a back door for this, and um, it has to do with um, our friend, the fovea. Okay, so in your eye, there's a place where most of the information gets captured. It's called the fovea. That's the high density area. There's a bunch of other areas around it that capture uh, shading and movement and things like that, but this is where most of the information comes. And it's, um, um, so if you focus on the fovea, um, sounds like a, a phrase or, um, you can actually put the information you need on the fovea and not worry about the rest of the eye. And that's called foveated rendering and display. Okay, so if you do that, you don't have to go up the five uh, to eight to 100x in terms of all the information you have to generate and display. You can actually just focus on the fovea and uh, display it there and you can generate realistic looking images, okay? So, um, so it's kind of like this. So you got a fancy motorcycle you're eyeballing. Um, and um, you're looking at a particular area of the motorcycle, and this is all um, handled by eye tracking, by the way. So the new headsets, and you know, shades of uh, privacy, by the way, but um, new headsets will track where your eyes are looking, and you can say, well, I'm looking right at the kind of gas tank area there, or the engine area, so I'm just gonna render all that very clearly. The stuff around it, I'm not gonna bother about so much and save a lot of effort doing that, and guess what? The user will never know. And there's been a bunch of studies done here. You, if you do this effectively, you can render, you know, a tenth the information and nobody even knows it. So, so that's the rendering side. That's generating the image. The other side of this is how do you display that information now? So if you want to display very high resolution in a small area of the, of the head mount display, how do you do that? Well, the, those clever Finnish people, um, uh, there's a company called Vario, uh, based out of Helsinki, I'm saying that wrong. They've actually come up with a display that um, has a super high resolution display that moves around in front of your eye. So as you move your eye, it will track that and display right in front of your eye, basically. The rest of it's filled in with a low res display and uh, it's like you're looking at a uh, super high resolution picture. It's pretty amazing. So, um, so this is getting solved. Um, I won't talk too much about depth of focus, um, the virgin's accommodation problem, but just uh, enough to say that multiple people are looking at it, including people that have $2.4 billion of uh, uh, funding on the right, um, that's Magic Leap. Um, so that problem will be solved as well. Okay, so with all this good stuff, what can you do? Okay, so now I have a video and I hope it plays and has audio. Um, so I'm not sure if the control booth can Let's see what happens when I press go here. Nothing, okay. Um, there's a really great video online <laughs> that uh, you should uh, go see. Um, use the word siren and unreal. And uh, this was shown at a game developer conference uh, about a month ago or so. This is actually an animated character. Um, it was real-time animated using a motion capture rig, uh, almost indistinguishable from a human. Um, 
Uh, if you've heard of the Uncanny Valley, which is the, yeah, this is on the, almost out of the Uncanny Valley. Uh, they've traveled for years and almost made it out now. So pretty amazing stuff. Um, so go take a look at this video uh, online and uh, guarantee you'll be impressed. They also have a guy uh, reading something out of Hamlet who turns into an alien in the middle of it. And uh, uh, that's also quite impressive. So, um, and just to show you what it took to animate this character on the left. So that's a fake character on your left. Uh, and that's the woman who's actually animating her real time. Uh, that rig um, is actually significantly reduced from previous uh, versions of it and will be reduced more. So another thing that's going to happen is that um, being able to capture facial expressions, including eyes and cheeks and, and mouth and everything, um, that's all going to shrink down into headset size uh, within the next couple, three years. And you'll be able to have collaborative conferences that Alan talked about, and you'll be able to see people that aren't avatars with randomly blinking eyes, but you'll actually be able to see people nodding and uh, looking at you or not looking at you and things of that nature. So I think that's it. I've exceeded my 10 minutes, so uh, what is old is new, and thank you very much. And next we have Will Wade from NVIDIA. Pleasure, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, NVIDIA, why are we here? You've, a few of you have probably heard of us. We make uh, graphics chips that do video games really well. Some of you younger guys will know that. Um, some of you guys with my color hair may not know about us, but uh, we make some great graphics chips. Uh, for you CS majors that bought that graphics chip to play a game, um, you've smartened up and learned about this whole blockchain thing and uh, Ethereum mining and Bitcoin mining, and you realize that the bigger the GPU you buy, the more money it spits out the back of the PC. So uh, please keep buying those big ones and <laughs> keep going. Um, we actually have another business that we call the professional visualization business. So do we use VR in gaming? Absolutely we do. We support that. Uh, we built a Ready Player One game. Uh, in VR that people can go play. It's an escape room based on the movie. It's kind of cool. Um, but on the professional side, we do a lot of things with uh, graphics in general and VR, and that's what I wanted to talk about here. So um, I want to build on Paul's history. Um, I haven't been around as long as him, so we let him do the history part of it. Um, and then uh, uh, the technology part, I'm not as smart as him, so we let him do the technology part. Um, what I do is product management. We take that technology that gets invented by these really smart guys, and we get to go talk to people who use this stuff and have a pain point or a problem they want to solve or a need that they need to, to do. And that's where I get to sit. I get to bring those together. So I want to talk to you about the use cases that we're starting to see today, which over the next five years as a future vision, um, we're really going to start to see taking off. So these are some of the ones that we're starting to see, some of the customers that we're starting to work with. The big ones that are using this stuff right now in the professional space outside of gaming are the media and entertainment guys, right? The building this stuff in VR, um, the Ready Player One movie was actually filmed in an environment um, where they were in VR. The director Spielberg would come in, put on a VR headset, have a camera controller, and he would walk around the set and he would say, I want this camera angle, and not just, I want this camera angle, record, here we go. Okay, movie's done, right? So uh, VR and media entertainment is, is huge and it's gonna grow even more. Um, manufacturing and design, big use case. Uh, architecture, I'm gonna dive into these two a little bit deeper to show you. Um, architecture is an easy one to, to get our minds around, right? If we build this room, if we build this building, um, there's a lot of use cases in architecture itself where we can use um, VR and augmented reality. Let's start with the designer in the top left there, right? You can sit at your desk, see what your design is going to be in, right? You can see the, the cars in relation to the building, your building in relation to the next building. Uh, if you're lucky enough to design a building in Colorado, your building in relation to the mountains that drop behind it, right? So all of that can be done in VR, um, and we're seeing that happen today. Um, design reviews. So I can take and build a cardboard model of my building, or I can put it in VR and let my client see it. And my client doesn't, by the way, have to sit here. He can sit in New York City if that's where he happens to sit, or he can sit in Shanghai, and I can share with them uh, virtually uh, their building and get their approval. Uh, facility planning, once we do that, um, you know, we just built a new building in, in Santa Clara, our headquarters. Um, so facility planning came in after that, and our world is built around cubicles. Um, not to discourage you any from graduating and going out into that world, but, uh, you know, the. Building planning is all about how many monkeys can we squish into a smaller space and before they get angry and, and 
kill each other, right? Um, you can do all of that in VR, right? Um, construction rehearsal, this, you can, it's hard to see the image here, but um, how do you coordinate construction? Uh, construction sites right, right now are a big choreography of people and machines moving, and how do, you, how do you make those interact together? If you can see that in 3D, you see that the tractor runs over the guy, or, or the guy runs over the other guy, or, right? Um, training is a big one. Um, marketing and sales. Now I've got this building in VR. Um, my goal as the sales guy is to fill it up before construction is done, or maybe even before construction starts. How do I do that if I can't show it to them? Well, put it in VR, you can sell stuff in VR, and I've got an example of that here in a second. Um, so this is a video of, of one of the architects at Canon Design, um, how they're using one of the tools that we built for them. This is the holodeck tool that Paul uh, talked about that we built. Um, you can see this is a design review with the client. So the client's actually in there. He's going to mark stuff up. He's going to measure it. He's going to um, give us some design ideas. Uh, these guys are collaborating, by the way, not in a room. right? They're collaborating virtually. So. Um, I don't remember their locations. The building here is actually in St. Louis. So I think the client was in St. Louis. Canon Design was um, either New York City or, or Chicago. Um, and so these, guys, these two guys are talking. The one guy's filming from his, his viewpoint. And the, uh, the customer here is saying, I'd, I'd really like to change this back wall to a different color. And so he's got a palette there where he can change that back wall color uh, instantaneously, right? Not going back to the designer, but the guy who's going to buy the building, the guy who's going to pay the money can actually go in there and do this, right? Um, he can also go in, um, you'll see him here in a second, he's going to draw on this chair. Um, he's not liking that style of chair, so he's going to say, what if we changed it to something like this? Right? This, is, this is not a designer, this is an amateur guy who can go in there and say, I really think this, and now the designer can take and build off of that, of that design. Okay. Uh, so that's architecture. Um, automotive design is another place where we're really seeing it take off. Um, and the things that are making it take off, right, like, as Paul mentioned, this stuff's been around forever. Why didn't we design the, the 1960 Carmen Ghia with virtual reality? Well, it's because some of the key components didn't exist. Some of the things that are making this really take off now is physics simulation. We can do real-time physics simulation in there so that when you touch the surface of the car, you, you touch it. You don't just go through it. You don't just look at it. You touch it, and it runs around the edge, right? Haptics feedback is coming. Um, we're going to be able to touch that car and feel the car feel the edge of the car, right? Um, collaboration is a big one. Um, unless you're a kid in your mom's basement playing video games, you really do want to collaborate, right? Um, workers want to work together. They want to get ideas together. And when we collaborate, we get bigger ideas. And so that ability to collaborate is, is really coming because of the bandwidth, um, because of some of the things that our Mark Zuckerberg and our friends in that evil world have built for us. They've built some great collaboration tools, and we're taking advantage of those. Um, and then physically based materials. We're able to now make materials, make a, a language that allows us to define a material based on its physical properties so that it can act exactly like it's supposed to act when you shine that light on it or when you shine that light through it, the physically based material. We actually compute where the light ray goes and what that light ray does. Does it reflect? Does it refract? Does it get absorbed? Um, does it change color, right? All of those things. So these three things are really helping us with the takeoff of VR and automotive design. Here's our, our uh, Project Holodeck, or, or uh, what we built to, to demo this out. This is a Koenigsegg. It's a sports car um, out of uh, Sweden. Um, and they, they're a very small company. Um, they have a few engineers. This is a, a, about a million and a half dollar sports car. Um, uh, if you want to see one, you can come over to my place later. I'll show no, no, no. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> um, but what you're seeing is these engineers really working in that space. Um, these guys don't have a lot of budget to go build 100 prototypes so they can bring them in and tear them apart, and measure this and do this, paint them different colors and see what it'll look like. Um, they don't have that capability to do that, right? So in VR, they can do this virtually. They can take the car apart. They can say, what about this? What if we stretch this out? Does the engine fit where we're thinking about putting the body panels, right? Fit and for, form and function are all uh, important to these guys. Do, are all the parts there, right? I need to look at the spring. He's going to pull a spring here in a minute, right? Does it fit around the strut that I'm planning to use, right? All of those things can be done in VR without having to build prototypes. So these guys are really taken off with this. Koenigsegg's an interesting example because, like I said, these, these sports cars are multi-million dollar things. They just came up with a design um, back in September that they wanted to test out with the world. 
Well, traditionally, the way you do that is you go build a clay model or you build a prototype or you build a dozen prototypes. You put it out there, you do focus groups, you spend a year studying that focus group, you redesign it, you put it out there. They didn't have the time or the money to do that or the personnel to do that. So they went and built a virtual model of the sports car. They took the CAD data that, that they had designed, put it in virtual reality. They took it to the Geneva Auto Show with our holodeck project and showed it to their VIP customers. So yeah, focus group, they're getting feedback. They're getting, they didn't actually just get feedback, they got orders. They took orders on a car that was only designed in virtual reality. And uh, now, $3 million sports car, now they have to go build it. Good problem to have, right? If you're selling out a condo before it's done being built, these guys actually sold the car before it was even fully designed. Right, so good, good use of VR um, in that space. Some other industries that we're seeing, hospitality, it's been talked about a couple times here, right? Uh, movie theaters are dying, they're struggling to get revenue. Uh, what can we do next? We're working with several companies who are starting to build facilities um, like the design center here on campus where you'll have a VR headset in every seat or you'll have an augmented reality experience not just in the seat but as you walk up to it. So, um, you know, maybe you go to a Nuggets game and you get to a different experience than you would uh, just sitting in the seat, right? Uh, medical is a huge one um, across many different use cases there, right? So surgeon training in VR, um, much lower cost than buying the cadavers that they have to buy or the chickens or the dead cats or whatever they have to operate on, right? The, the surgical training can be done for the cost of a video game. It's literally $19.99. You can download that application and do your training, right? So now it doesn't replace everything, but it does get us a lot better, a lot further along than, than you typically would without it. Um, we had a, a use case at our GPU tech conference a couple weeks ago um, where somebody is using VR to treat autism. So not just diagnose, not just learn about, but to treat autism, where they put the VR headset on, they teach people to interact, autism, the challenge there is interacting with other humans. They've built a game where it's designed to help kids with autism learn to interact, learn to talk with people. If I come into the restaurant and walk up to the counter, how do I order with that person? And if you do it correctly, you get a good score. If you don't do it correctly, you get a lower score. And these kids are just loving it because they love the, the individuality of that environment where they're by themselves, but they're in interacting with what could be real people, right? So it's really teaching them. Uh, retail, we're starting to see it, right? Not just with uh, condo complexes and Koenigsegg sports cars, um, but designing shoes. Um, we got a call the other day from um, the company that owns Gucci over in, in the Europe. Uh, we got a call from a company in Chicago that owns uh, Victoria's Secret. I don't get to work on those. We, we keep those out of the HR world, but uh, a lot of these people are trying to design their product, not just design, but show it off and, and get feedback. Um, other industries, training is a big one. Um, we're starting to see training pop up with virtual reality all over, uh, especially around, uh, we talked about education. Alan talked about you know, how we're using it here. But what about firefighters who have to go into a hazardous environment? Can we train them in a lot safer way so that they can be more prepared to go in? Um, military obviously would be using that as well. Um, expensive environments, costly environments. Um, NASA uses virtual reality to train astronauts how to fix the space station. Right? If you drop your wrench because you weren't paying attention to what you were doing at the space station and it floats away, that's expensive because now you got to fly another minute, another uh, wrench up there because there's no Home Depot around the corner. Right? And robotics is a big use one. Um, I want to talk about this one real quick. Uh, we're not just training people, we're training AI. Right, uh, let's use VR to train our AI. Um, we built a, a robot called Baxter, um, and we were gonna train it to do different things. Well, number one, it's expensive, so we only had one robot. Um, number two, it's a real, rather dangerous around humans, right? So you wanna teach it to do the right things before you put it around humans. We built Isaac, which is a virtual Baxter, put it in a virtual classroom, and taught it to play dominoes. And to play dominoes safely and smartly and put them in place, and now you can go play, and we took the brain out of the virtual Isaac, put it in the real Baxter, and now it can play dominoes with you. That's an interesting use case, but um, not very useful um, you know, in the end. But what about VR for training AI to drive cars? Right? With respect to the lady that was killed, um, that's a dangerous thing to be doing our R&D around self-driving cars on the street. What if we could do training for AI in virtual reality for self-driving cars? 
So what you're seeing here is Central Expressway out in the Bay Area. On the top left, that's the real video. On the right is the virtual reality environment that we built to mimic this video, right? And then the, on the bottom left is the AI that's learning from that. So you're seeing the lane detections, you're seeing the distance detection, that's the green line that goes out there, you're seeing the other um, objects that are on the street, all built in virtual reality, and we're using that to train there. Um, now we can change that virtual environment to do different types of training, right? So we've got a virtual reality environment that's um, the Bay Area, but that doesn't work in Colorado because it snows here, right? So we can throw snow into this. We can throw ice onto the road. We can throw other traffic into this. We can throw um, humans into this, pedestrians, jaywalkers, dogs, basketballs, kids, cats, right? Um, and we do teach them to swerve around the cats, not towards the cats, right? <clears throat> um, but all of this can be done at a much faster pace as well, right? So in, in the Bay Area, it does snow one day every 10 years. So if we were gonna train in the real world to drive in the Bay Area, Bay Area in snow, we have to wait for 10 years for that one day and we may not get it all done in that one day, so 20 years, we might get the second day, right? Now we can throw snow in here and train for every situation that we can do. And we can do it in parallel, right? So Uber's built a fleet of, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, actually I think it's 100 cars that they're out on the road testing. We can do 10,000 training sessions in parallel in, in minutes just by putting stuff in the data center. So as long as you stop buying the GPUs for Bitcoin mining, we can bring them over to the data center and do training for AI. So just uh, thoughts to leave you with, maybe some inspiration, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Thanks.